Well, welcome to the Institute of Managers and Leaders and our fourth webinar of the IML ANZ Development Day. My name is Sam Bell. I'm the General Manager of Corporate Services at the Institute and I've been the host today, or I am the host today, um, for um, the first three so far and I can't wait for this fourth one um, with Kerry Irwin. Um, coaching is an important part of the Institute of Managers and Leaders. It's actually a, it's actually a core part of our membership offering um, where senior managers um, can give back to the industry and both help train and develop younger managers. And coaching is also an integral part of all of our leadership and, uh, programs, all of our development work, all of our workshops. Coaching is a core uh, part of all of that that we do. And we believe that it's, a, it's certainly a differentiation that the Institute can offer um, to our corporate clients and indeed our members moving forward that um, uh, we can provide and facilitate that coaching and mentoring for them as they move through their career or indeed move through uh, one of our leadership programs. Now, Kerry Irwin is a facilitator for the Institute and she facilitates uh, our foundations program. But more than that, Kerry supports um, a number of our corporate clients. Um, in developing their staff, in taking their staff through the challenges that they require in, in coaching at their staff and uh, taking them to the next level as an individual and an organisation. And I'm delighted that Kerry can today present on um, coaching um, th uh, your team through a crisis or coaching your team through uncertainty. Um, I think is it's a, such a valuable topic as we move into and out of the COVID-19 crisis that um, has obviously faced business and individuals. So in the current state um, of, of the Australian business um, environment, indeed um, internationally, there's never been a greater need for communication with your team and your team members will each be dealing with the uncertainties in their role and their personal circumstances very differently. All, all your staff will need the assistance at various stages from you as their leader. Your role in order to support your team to provide coaching, to offer support, empathy and guidance. At this time, when extreme flexibility is needed, coaching can help build your team members' resilience, capability and their development. Your coaching may be enhanced by using the GROW coaching model, which Kerry will take us through, which gives you the roadmap for active listening and engagement with your people. So for today's uh, session, um, there's four key things that uh, we believe you know, are certainly part of that GROW model that you need to take away. Use active listening techniques in, vir in a virtual environment. Support your team members in seeking out and owning their solution. Build confidence, ownership and a sense of achievement. And also strengthen the ongoing communication you have between yourself and each of the people in your team. So those four things will be at the forefront of Kerry's presentation. And without further ado, I might introduce Kerry, who's a highly credentialed HR professional and experienced HR executive generalist. And Kerry, as I said, is the facilitator of our foundations program. She's also been the vice president and director of human resources at a number of multinational organisations. And Kerry's currently engaged by Boral as part of their organisational development team, developing and delivering best practice leadership programs to support their staff. And as I said, as well, um, is working with a number of IML corporate clients to develop their leadership capability and their leadership programs um, for their organisations. So, Kerry, I'm delighted that you're presenting on this topic. It's going to be fantastic and I'll hand it over to you. Oh, thanks, Sam. Appreciate it. Hello, everybody in webinar land. Yeah, we're going to talk about coaching in crisis. Um, I don't know about you, but for the term um, feeling fear and doing it anyway, is, uh, is something that's resonated quite strongly with me recently. Um, and I'm sure with all of you out there in regards to yourselves and with your teams, um, with your family, we've had you know in incredible um, problems and challenges within Australia. So um, I'm, I'm happy to come and talk today about um, leading in crisis. And we're going to, as Sam mentioned, so the first thing is gonna talk about leading in crisis in particular, I'm going to talk about communication virtually. What is coaching? Uh, the role of a coach, what does that mean? Um, active listening rather than passive listening, rather than um, you just thinking within yourself, it's active listening is thinking about and focusing on the other person and their and their challenges. We're going to step through the GROW model, 
And then I've done an acronym at the end to help um, around coaching in crisis uh, to take away and have something that is, encapsulates the things that we're talking about today, but just with some prompts around the acronym COACH. So hopefully that will be of help. So leading in crisis. So um, the Collins Dictionary talks about a crisis is a crucial, crucial stage or turning point in the course of something in, in a sequence of events. Um, and it even talks about a disease, under, um, interestingly, in the Collins Dictionary. So I think, that, you know, from Australia's perspective, you and your teams and your family have been, um, you know, stepping through things in Australia, such as we've had um, a, a huge amount of drought, we've had um, incredible um, bushfire incidents um, in Australia, particularly on the East Coast, we've had floods, um, and now we've got a global pandemic. I mean, this pandemic, um, we haven't seen anything like this in the world. Well, I haven't because I'm not that old and I'm sure you're not either out there. Um, but basically for 100 years since the Spanish flu. So no one could have predicted what we've had to face in the last six months. Having said that, you know, leading a crisis, crisis comes, a crisis point can come to leaders at any, any stage in their career. It could be environmental as we're currently facing, could be the economy as we may face in the future. And at that time, it's critical for you as a leader to stop and think and gather as many, many data points as you can, including taking your team with you within, within what's happening with the crisis. The first thing I'm gonna talk about you personally as a leader, because this is really important. From the point of view of you being a coach, you have to actually do a lot of checking in with yourself as a leader and you're dealing with fear or panic um, that's happening around you first before you can actually reach out and, and talk and, and help others within your team. So an authentic leader understands they don't have the picture of the future and they have to be comfortable with that or try to be as comfortable as possible. And that's a difficult thing because basically, you know, as, as humans, we like a surety we like, um, you know, structure, we like community, we'd like to have support around us. But at this point, you don't have a solid picture of the future. And no one does in the pandemic. I mean, it's just been incredible for us to have lived through this. Um, they an authentic leader hears many voices, they integrate them to one voice. So they listen to other people, they listen to their thoughts. You don't have the picture of the future. But others may have some suggestions or thoughts that help you formulate that picture. So having a think about what people are talking to you about, of course, the D there because it made me laugh because I was thinking sometimes it's a little we're a little bit headless chickens in some um, um, in the things that have happened to us recently. But I'm um, hear many voices, but integrate them into one voice. Um, they understand that good fear promotes good preparation. So the thing is that, for example, when I worked at Talus. Um, what happened in, after 9-11 was that the organisation, because unfortunately they lost some people in the buildings, in the towers in, in America, that they actually um, learned from that and, and put good solid risk management and risk preparation as a result of that across the world. So they stepped back and thought about what, um, what they needed to do if anything like this happened in the future. They're humble. So Authentic leaders in crisis or otherwise always are humble. They don't always have the answers and they say to people, they don't have the answers. Um, it, it, because the thing is that people respect that, you know, yes, most of the time you will have the, the answers as a leader, but you know, if you don't, it's okay to say you don't. It's all right to be that way. It shows a vulnerable trust with your people. You're agile and flexible. So from the point of view of the crisis that um, we're currently facing and have in the past and other issues that will arise, there are things where you have to move quickly and you don't have to, the thing is that most people want to have 120% surety before they make a decision. You don't, you don't need that. You need at least maybe 80% and then you have to go and be flexible about the other um, 20 to 40% of surety around the decision making. I have seen as well within organisations, and I've watched um, particularly the ones that I'm close to at the moment, um, a lot of hierarchical structure and a lot of command and control 
has has eased. I've seen it ease, and people are given more um, bandwidth to actually make decisions on their own and of their of their own volition, and uh, and they're better decisions in a lot of the cases. So it's very interesting to me to see what's happening with organisations at the moment. They hold true to their values. So an authentic leader holds true to their values. If you have nothing else from a guiding perspective in, a, in leading a crisis, you revert to your values. And hopefully those values are the same as the organisations. Or, you know, from the point of view of guiding, making a decision, using the organisation's values to make a decision, if, not, if you have nothing else, helps you in that process. They have courage. Authentic leaders have courage. So it's better to make a decision than no decision. And recognise and be confident in yourself that having courage to make a decision and if it's the wrong one, that you can fix it. You're in that role for a reason. You, you're leading a team. Have courage the, to the fact that if you do make a mistake, you can, you're going to be able to fix that. And know that wisdom is extracted from adversity. So the thing is that we are all learning right now. We are all in a massive learning curve and so are your, your team and your employees. But understand that we should learn from that and we should learn to, to move forward with making better decisions and being able to work with that team more closely. And focus on effective and frequent communication. And I have to say that's one of the most key things that uh, I've seen many, many leaders fail at um, in that they understand where they're going and their vision and what they're trying to achieve, but they haven't taken the people along with them. And I think that, you know, from a coaching perspective, um, this is a, a fantastic opportunity for you to get closer to your people, for you to effectively and frequently communicate with them. Let's talk about managing virtual teams for a moment. So managing virtually, I've seen a lot of organisations now have to move, as you would have, from um, being in the office and being able to um, wander around and have those, uh, you know, ad hoc or um, short little conversations to move a project forward or to get to understand people better about their position on a particular issue. With um, when you're in a virtual state and when you're managing people remotely, and there's about 70% of Australia, I would say, that's managing remotely, you need to double down on the fundamentals of good management. This is a statement from Julie Wilson from Harvard um, University. And, and she says, managing a virtual team requires managers to double down on the fundamentals of good management, including establishing clear goals, running great meetings, communicating clearly and leveraging team members' individual and collective strengths. So by doubling down, we mean, so the thing is from a point of view of your communication with your team is, is refresh goals, look at their goals and look at what you're trying to achieve. And this is part of the flexibility as well. Goals could change weekly in the current environment. Run great meetings. So have informal parts of your meeting and have, I know many, many, um, companies are having um, coffee catch-ups, um, they're having lunch lunch breaks online, they're having, um, they run um, trivia pursuit, trivial pursuit, <laughs> trivial pursuit um, activities, they do uh, all sorts of Pictionary, I know some, um, some teams that have been doing Pictionary, anything to help um, break down and help people relax using the virtual um, modalities. And they communicate clearly, they um, communicate clearly and often in regards to managing a virtual team. So how do you communicate with your team? As I mentioned, there's many ways, there's the informal ways, but meaning, it's important to um, set yourself a communication plan um, in order to make sure that you keep up with it. Because I know when I've run big teams and, and it's been you know running at a million miles an hour, I I forget to communicate with some people. I forget to take my stakeholders along with me. I think, oh, it's in my head. They must know what I'm trying to achieve. But it's important to make sure that you communicate with your team. So that could come in the form of emailing to the whole team, which, you know, this is all simple stuff, but the stuff that we lose sometimes, we, you know, make sure we have consistent full team meetings. So I know that people in the past might have been having a team meeting once a month or once a fortnight, and now they're having full team meetings every week. 
and also important to have those individual face-to-face -face just check-ins you know I know um, some of the guys that I've been um, coaching and working with in the foundations program have moved to you know calling the people um, once or twice a week and just having that phone check-in to see how they're going and that's really important from the perspective of um, you know keeping abreast of what's happening. So what is coaching? So coaching is an ongoing partnership and it's about building capability through reflection and development to achieve goals. So it can be between two people or you can coach in a team, you can actually coach in a coaching circle. Um, and the thing is, from, from my perspective, the words there is partnership between the two people or the team, because basically what it, what, when you're coaching someone, you, you are learning from them as much as they're learning from you. I can assure you from all the coaching that I do with IML and in the past as well with other companies that I come away from that more enriched and more um, energised after, you know, doing coaching sessions with people. So as much as they get stuff from me, I get a lot from them as well. The role of a coach. So there's very various roles um, and processes that a coach um, does, which I'll talk about in a moment. But it's to help someone um, develop the skills they need to be successful in their role is the, is the key is the key point. Um, to provide a framework, so sometimes people get lost in the mire of the of what's happening to them. There's so much happening to them, particularly at the moment, and there's a lot of anxiety and fear. It's to provide a framework to to work through to get people to get results. Ask good questions and we talk about when we talk about good questions we talk about open questioning. So open questions are when you not you're not seeking a yes or no answer. So they're things like using the words why, when, how, if, etc. So that open so that the answer has to be more than a yes or no answer. To allow someone to discover. So this is important because you may know and in a coaching situation you may well know the answer long before the individual or you may think you know the answer but it's to help them to discover it because if they discover it and discover the solution they'll own it they will actually take it forward and have much more ownership than you telling them what you did in the past and how successful that was and also to hold someone accountable so when you're doing coaching it can't be that you walk away and go oh that's a nice chat because you know sometimes it is a good chat um, but you should be able to hold and write down something in regards to accountability. And we'll work through the GoPro model, which will help with that. So why do we coach? We coach for career development and focusing on develop, developing skills and capabilities. And people, and people tend to attach that as the, as the main reason that we do coach. And it is one of the main reasons that we coach. So we're thinking about what are the current skills and capabilities as an individual? Where do they where do they want to head? What sort of things do they want to learn in their current role? Or what do they want to learn for their future role and where they want to be in the future? We coach for performance, so introducing performance gaps and behaviours. And that's a little tougher because the thing is that at this point in time from a coaching perspective, there's things that have happened that people aren't delivering on or there's been some behavioural issues or there's been some things around um, time management, for example, or not delivering on a project. And that's, that's, that's a more challenging way to do coaching, but it's very effective. And coaching for, is, can be attached to incident related. So focusing on emotional support. And I'm sure you people out there at the moment, there's been some stuff where you've had to, to actually coach people through some of the things that they're dealing with, the uncertainties, particularly around at the moment. I know what's coming at the moment, and for those that have already been affected, is around their roles for the future. And I know that organisations are, are struggling with trying to keep um, people in the business um, for the future, but also think about their costs, etc. And that's impacting um, employees. If employees aren't being communicated with at this point from, um, some, from some assurity about their future and from their employment perspective, this is where you get a lot of gossip and a lot of uncertainty. And, you know, I'm sure that a lot of you out there are talking to people about, um, their, you know, your team's future 
roles and place in the organisation that they're, they're currently in. So, um, and understanding when you're focusing on an incident related or emotional support issue coaching, understand where your, your role starts and finishes. Because from an emotional support perspective, we are a manager or a leader or um, a HR manager helping an individual. Are we not professionals in regards to um, psychology or psychiatry or doctors? So we need to know and understand where our role starts and finishes and being able to hand them on and direct them to someone else if they need further support in um, a physical or emotional sense. So what makes a great coach? They check in in their own emotional state before they start doing a coaching um, process. So make sure that when you go in, in there that you put your fears aside, and, and we all have to do this, put our fears aside about what we're dealing with um, before we go in to chat to somebody about um, a particular coaching process. You can engender trust by being vulnerable and honest. So you can make it quite clear that you don't have all the answers. And in fact, it's good to share um, somewhere where you've fallen down um, in regards to a process or, or a project or a job or, you know, something that resonates when you're having the discussion with the coachee. Able to suspend judgment. So it's important that you are able to um, think not in terms of, sometimes you go into a coaching um, situation and you think, wow, is that your biggest problem? kidding but sometimes you do and you've got to you've got to suspend your judgment because this is their issue this is what they're dealing with they deal with it differently there are you know things that have happened in the past that have, may raise um you know issues that they haven't dealt with now are re-raised by what's happening within their environment so you have to suspend your judgment and not be judgmental push that to the side um, you need to, uh, as a great coach, be able to authentically support the, the coachee. So it's important that you want to support the person. Um, and if you if you don't feel that way, then you better go back and check on your own emotional state because it's important that you're going in with helping this person find a solution. This is a, this is critical, and I spoke to it before. But you do not you you don't allow yourself to jump into the coaches to solve the coaches' problems. And we will talk about the grow model and how you have to step through that model and how tempting it is to actually give the solution. Um, and understand there are many different solutions. So whilst you may have a solution to the coaches' problem, it may not be the right one. It may be that you know you've they have a much better solution, and that's what you're hoping to get. And maybe you have to, you know, do a bit of um, suggestions and uh, inference around getting a solution. But, you know, there are many different solutions to a problem or a challenge. Active listening. So it's important that we let the other person finish their sentences. And I know that in Australia, we're not very good at this. <laughs> I have to say, well, I'm pretty terrible too sometimes. But basically, we all seem to jump in and finish things before, the, you know, oh, yeah, we know what they're going to say. You know, they went down to this hardware store and they found this and, and you jump in. No, no, no. You didn't let the other person finish their sentences. Um, it's important, even if they're somebody that's slow to gather process or slow to gather um, their thoughts, it's important to let them do that. Make sure you look at the speaker, not past the speaker, not over his head, not over her head. Make sure that you look at the speaker and keep eye contact. And that eye con contact is very important for the person to trust, to be open with you. Use open body language. So make sure that you sit, um, you know, not with arms crossed, even though arms crossed is sometimes quite comfortable. But it's important to be quite open and face the person and make sure that they can see that you um, are are quite engaged with them by your body language. And that could be that you mirror some of the things that they, their posture, and that sometimes helps in openness as well. Ask questions. So as I talked about, ask open questions too. And, and, and when you ask an open question, you don't just ask one, something may come up in that, in that um, answer, that then prompts you to ask another open question that delves down deeper. 
I have to say from a coaching perspective, I knew coaches out there would understand this, but sometimes it's not what people say, it's how they say it. it it's, it's incredible to me that, that um, and, it, and you can still get this from a point of view of being online, but they'll bring something up and there'll be a word in there or a phrase or something that you think, that's, yeah, okay, I need to explore that. I need to, they've said that in a certain way that I, that, that is unpacking, that I need to unpack to get to the bottom of a particular issue. Be and look interested. So it's important to look interested, but you also should be interested. I have to say is when, I, when coaching, um, it's important to shut the voices down in your head um, and be present and still and and completely in the moment in the coaching process. I found when I learned to do that, that I was a lot calmer when I was having the coaching conversation because I was suspending my conversation in my head about, you know, I'm gonna go and cook dinner and I've got to do this and I've got three people waiting to see me. But no, just being present in regards to the coaching and be and look interested. Take notes, that's really important to take notes. Um, from my perspective, I, you know, it's, you know, having different conversations with different people, it's important to understand and keep a record of what's, what's been discussed and maybe check to ensure you've understood by paraphrasing. So repeating back to them what they have said. Be careful about this, but it's, it's got to be done in a certain style so that you don't actually sound um, like you're denigrating or demeaning them, et cetera. So be very careful about how you do it, but paraphrasing is, is uh, uh, quite a key tool. So the GROW model, and this is, gives you a framework for coaching, and you can use this for individuals, or you can use it for teams as well. So we're going to talk particularly around individuals, and we're going to talk particularly around career development um, discussion of our coaching. So what is the what is the goal of the GROW model? So the GROW model GROW model is by setting goals to inspire and challenge and measurable and achievable in a realistic time frame. And the GROW model's intent is to promote confidence, self-motivation for that person to own the solution and get some personal satisfaction. So that's, and it's been around a long time and it's, it's stood the test of time. We still use it today in regards to coaching and uh, it's invaluable in regards to making a process or a framework for you and the coachee to step through. So using GROW. So the first point of call, the first step is to talk about the goal. So what do you want to do? What is the coachee trying to achieve? So you agree to topics for discussion. Um, you agree specific objectives of the session and set long-term aim if appropriate. So in regards to um, in regards to goals, um, what you've got to do is you might spend quite a deal of time here because um, people's goals, maybe they're unsure and maybe you need to ask a few more questions. I know that IT professionals who support people in the business, they would spend a lot of time when people say, oh, I want a system to fix this. They would spend a lot of time in this particular space to understand exactly what they want to achieve. And when we do the GROW model and we start with goals, you usually only do a, a um, coaching session for an hour, an hour and a half tops, but that could be unpacking other things as well, but an hour, because from a focus perspective, um, you know, adults, we usually, our attention spans usually around 45 minutes. So it's important to say, okay, we're going to sit down and have a coaching session, around the GROW model, explain the GROW model to them, and then say, we're, we're gonna spend an hour this time. And if we don't conclude, then we'll book in in a week's time and have another hour, a few days time and have another hour to, till we achieve what we need to achieve. So as I said, starting with goals, what do you wanna do? Um, then the next step is reality. So you invite self-assessment about where is the individual, the coach here up to at the moment? So you can offer specific examples of feedback. Um, you can get them to um, check assumptions. Um, maybe there's some irrelevant history. Sometimes people go down rabbit holes about what's happened to them in the past that's caused them to get to this point. You need to bring them back to, um, you know, what's happening, where are you right now in regards to achieving your goal? 
next step is options. So this is the time where you where you brainstorm. And no idea is too silly. And this is where you're getting the coachy putting out ideas and suggestions. You can offer suggestions here, but you have to be very careful about you offering suggestions at this point um, because you don't want to be telling them what to do. You don't want to be jumping in with solution. Very tempting, I have to say. I'm one of those people that I've got to be careful. Um, but offer suggestions carefully and ensure some choices are made at this point. So what sort of things um, could we do and what are we going to take forward in this in this space? And then the next step and the final step is the way forward. So what will, what will you do? And basically your commitment to action, um, you think about obstacles. So what could be the obstacles to achieving that particular action? Um, make specific, um, specific um, steps with timings and agree on support. And be careful about, you can offer support about for this individual to, or coach you to achieve this. But be careful that you don't step in and do too much for that individual because remember we want them to own it. We want them to feel a sense of achievement and if we do too much hand-holding um, in order to achieve something then that goes away, that diminishes. So that's the that's the process of the GROW model and, the, and stepping through um, that particular process. The next one is, so these are the sort of questions and we, in IML, we, we can provide other questions as well. Um, you know, in our programs, we do a lot of practice around the GROW model and we have other questioning um, techniques, but you will find stuff online as well. But basically, goals, what do you want to do? What you would see questions like, well, what would you like to achieve? Um, what would you like to improve? What skills do you need to develop? So what sort of things do you need? You know, you can, what you would talk about um, when you're talking about what you would like to achieve. So what's your next role? What, how do you think you would, you, what do you need to, do you think you need to do to get there? What sort of things, experiences, do you need to do a course? Or is there some experiences within the business you need to do in order to achieve it? The reality. So what are your results so far? So where are you currently in your career? What have you done to date? Um, what sort of things have set you up for future success? What is the impact if we don't do anything? What if you don't do anything at this point? Um, what are your strengths and weaknesses? And it's important that that person analyzes what their strengths and weaknesses are in regards to particularly in career development um, in terms of their next role. A lot of times people say they want to move to another role that could could be out of their um, out of their league for the next pro from the next step perspective. So you need to um, analyze what their strengths and weaknesses are with them. And options, so what have you tried previously? And it's interesting here, you can, in options and what could you do, you can do some clever questioning to get the people to really, or the coach to really think about uh, what sort of things they could try um, or what sort of things they've done um, in the past and maybe tweak that a little. And that's clever in terms of, you have to be quite clever in your questioning without actually providing solutions. Because this is, the, as I said, this is the dangerous point where you want to provide solutions. What would you like to try? And nothing's nothing's off the table. Um, you know, talk about blue spying, no idea is a silly idea. Um, and what ideas do you have? So what sort of things um, do you have that you think might help you go um, to, re to resolution of your goal. And then the questions are around will, what will you do? So what do you think the next step is? What do you think we can do from here? What barriers do you need to overcome? So are there things in the way that um, we need to, you know, if we want to move into the next role, maybe the barriers that need to overcome is you need to actually sign up for a university course or you need to go and do some shorts courses or you need to um, go and work in another department or expand and expand your capability and um, skill before you move forward. And, and the question you ask is, what is the best way for me to support you? And that's, that's a really good question to ask and pose because you're in this together. But remembering it's not about you doing it for them, it's how you can support them. So the GROW model is a very effective model. Um, it's it's, as I said, you can go around the model um, and you can be stuck in one place for quite some time. 
and that's okay. That's all right. That's better to get a better outcome than move through too fast. Don't have the, I've got to do it an hour. I'm going to do 15 minutes on this one, on goals, 15 minutes on reality. No, it's okay to pause at a particular stage. And the other thing to understand and know is that sometimes you will go back. So you might go, all right, I've talked about goals and then you get to reality and you think, oh, actually, we need to re we need to go back to goals. Or we've got to options, but we need to go back to reality. So it's okay to move around the circle and back around the circle as well. And understand that that may happen in regards to coaching. So this is an acronym that I um, put together um, for coaching in crisis because I thought, what sort of things can we take away um, in regards to the environment and in regards to being a good coach and um, and working um, with teams and individuals in regards to coaching. So the first one is, so I've got the C-O-A-C-H, very clever. <laughs> no. Um, so the first one is, Communicate. So set time for two-way communication. So look at all the channels. Use active listening techniques. So I have, from a point of view of when you're in crisis or any time, we need to be um, very cognizant of our communication plans. And it could be that um, we, in fact, I encourage leaders in their first 90 days of being a, a team leader or a manager is to set down a communication plan. So what are you going to do to make sure that you're communicating effectively with your team? Make sure you look at all channels and use all channels and use active, te active listening techniques. So, oh, objectives. So what are you and your team trying to accomplish to be clear and map out the journey? So what are you trying to uh, uh, accomplish? And what and these may change, you know, from the point of view of, of um, a, a past environment and our current environment. Adaptive to the needs of your team, impact and environment. Example, virtual. So a lot of organisations have had to work virtually for quite some time. And then we're going back into the workplace. Um, some are returning to work and we're suddenly looking at how are we going to manage the um, social distancing within our environment? And those things raise other issues as well that we have to work through. So you may have to adjust the co your course and those of your team weekly, daily, hourly. So using communication techniques and using coaching, that can help that. So care. So good leaders care. And people can tell whether you care or not. They can they can see whether that you're in um, in in the in your role only for yourself or for the team and people in their team so they're authentic and they support their team and they put their personal worries aside and put themselves in the shoes of their team members so think about you have to be very cognizant and think about what are you, what would your team members be going through right now and in particularly in this crisis period they help their team to build confidence ownership and a sense of achievement so they're all about with your team, um, you need to be able to walk away from your team at any point and know that the job will get done. So coaching people will help um, build the team's confidence and capability so that they that you can go and play golf if you want to <laughs> go for a walk, but you wouldn't. But basically that's, you know, basically that's a, an important part of coaching is to bring the capability of your team up. You're only as good as the weakest link of, the, of a person in your team. They have humility and honesty. So when you're coaching, you park your own ego. So it's very important when you're coaching not to um, tell lots of war stories about what you've accomplished, tell lots of war stories about how you've come out ahead in a particular crisis or a project. You've got to park your own ego. This is about them. Yes, we can. you can um, make suggestions or give them some stories that, um, are, that are relevant, at, uh, if someone's struggling, but make sure that this is about them in regards to um, helping your team member. When coaching, you're helping your team member pursue their own solutions. So you're not jumping in, um, providing solutions. That's really important um, because of the ownership um, that they need to have. So the other, th the, my final thing about this is that uh, in coaching and crisis is you don't have all the answers 
especially at a time of crisis. You don't. We talked about that at the beginning. You just need to, you know, listen to people, um, get as much information as you can, um, and do your best um, to be on the front foot. But you, above all, you must be kind to yourself. Take time out and look after yourself and make sure that you don't drown in regards to, um, you know, handling crisis and, and having to work in extraordinary hours and, you know, trying to hold everyone up. So be kind to yourself and be kind to your team. And that's it from me. And we're going to have some questions now, Sam. Thank you so much, Kerry. Um, fantastic presentation, um, thoroughly engaging, and I certainly took a lot away from it um, about how to be the best coach I can be, and certainly using that GROW model. So thank you very much. And I know you love questions, and I know you love engaging um, with, uh, with the do. audience. Um, so if anyone has questions, please continue to send them through. We do have a number here, and I, I just want to, there's probably three questions that I could put into one context for you. Um, to firstly answer is about the the, the boundaries um, of coaching. So uh, mm. I'll just go through the three questions. They're all very similar, but I, I just mm. I just pulled them together because I thought we could address it all as one. Are there any specific rules of engagement or guidelines in the coach coachy relationship? Um, would you be um, it would be interested to hear a little more about the boundaries at this time? Many people going through a lot personally as well. And then if a coachy has a the problem that seems to be unable to be resolved and may need professional level of assistance, psychology, etc., and they don't see that, how can this scenario be managed? So I, I thought all of those three, those three questions from John, Andrea and Jamal, certainly I thought had a similar connotation around where, you know, where you start and stop as a coach. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, from the perspective as a coach, as a manager and leading your team, you have to look at what, what's your role description as a manager? And that is about, you know, leading your team at work. Uh, so, it, and understanding that people do bring issues from home. We're, we're human beings. Everyone, um, you know, is dealing with um, things that are happening in their um, wider life and lifestyle. But understanding that from the perspective of um, you as a manager, you can only really control and help what happens at work. Um, so thinking about that from a point of view of structure around being a coach, um, this is about what you can help with. And sure, you can help with flexibility from your work environment for them at home. You can offer them support. So if you've got an employee assistance program, and, I, you know, I think that, you know, it's, it's an absolute must for organisations to have an employee assistance program, and that's where you have psychologists available um, for the organisation for you to get um, to pass employees onto, um, and understand you'll know you'll know when you're in a discussion as to when you're out of your depth and that you've ventured too far down their personal their personal life. So you come back to what do I control, what do I lead, and that's you as a manager within the organisation. Now, as far as getting someone to go to, to support, I think you've got to be quite frank with them. Um, I think that, you know, and sometimes it's tough to have that conversation, but getting them to understand that you've done as much as you can as a manager and a leader and that, that, that they have to take some ownership of this and, that, and getting them to actually seek help. Now, you can help them. There's many places online that you can um, look up, you know, Beyond Blue. There's a lot of crisis support um, and steer them towards that if you don't have an employee system program. Great points, Kerry. Thank you very much um, for discerning that. The major difference, uh, sorry, I'll just come to this one. What would you do, uh, this is from Una, uh, what would you do if your manager wasn't displaying um, uh, a, a coach mod, a coach coachy model? Okay. Maybe you could suggest that you can use the grow model. I mean, you know, we, we, it's, it's, we can manage upwards, we, we can. Um, and maybe you take the grow model to that to that particular manager and say, I'd like to. I've I've learned about this model. I think it's a, it's really great for us to use as, as our process. And let's can we do that? And we'll not even ask can we do it. Let's do that. 
um, and then basically get um, get the manager to step through with that. Get your get your you have a good understanding of the grow model before you have that discussion, so that you can guide the manager through it. Great point. Um, at what now? There's a lot of questions coming through, Kerry. So we're going to be busy for the next ten minutes at least here. Um, at what point does coaching performance become performance management? Okay. So okay. So coaching so the, performance. So okay. So you have to look at from the point of view of um, the individual and what the issue is. So this varies. It's very great. It's it varies according to what's what's occurred. But if you have have a coaching conversation with somebody, say they're late for work, let's go with that one. Um, they've been consistently half an hour late for work. They don't give give reasons as to why, reasonable reasons as to why. Um, and you sit down and you have a coaching conversation with them about what's happening, um, how can this be addressed, um, what can you do to help, um, maybe some flexibility, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That that's your first conversation. Then if it happens again, this then then it becomes a uh, a verbal warning conversation because basically you've had that conversation, you talk to them in a coaching manner, and and it depends on the severity, obviously, but then you would move to you would move to performance management. So you might have one or two coaching conversations, you know, a good friendly chat, um, and then you move and then you would move on to performance management if the person wasn't. Um, working to standard. How can you coach someone to focus their energy on factors within their control, uh, such as problem solving, client management, okay. versus, um, such as problem solving and client management versus, sorry, versus factors that cannot be influenced? So how can you okay. coach them with factors that can be controlled versus factors that can't be? And those uh, were identified as salary, working hours and business policies that perhaps that, that coach cannot influence. Okay, so you talk about the sphere of influence, so you talk about the circle, so your middle circle is what you control, what you can influence is, a, is the, out, it's the next circle and the outer circle is what you have no control over. And then basically you talk the individual through that and you can map out what they have control about, what they don't have, what they can influence and what they don't have control about. And then talk them through a, a, about the issues that they don't have control about, how are they going to change in terms of their behaviour to, to react to that and manage that? Because you, if you can't control it, then you need to change how you react to it and how, and how you respond to that. Um, the other issue, unfortunately, if there's things such as, you know, wages, et cetera, et cetera, that, you know, in, unfortunately, sometimes people have to, they, they might want to move on. If there's something that is so severely is impacting their performance. Kerry, a couple of, thank you for that. That's the HR manager coming out of me, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Always, Kerry. Um, another couple of questions have been about too much. So is there a statistic to show how often we should do formal coaching session? Is there anything, is there anything um, as too much coaching or too much communication with someone? I don't think so. Uh, I haven't personally never experienced too much. Um, it's interesting in organisations where I've looked after communication within the organisation. It didn't matter how many times we did, you know, um, email blasts, communications from the CEO, uh, you know, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations, uh, team conversations, et cetera, et cetera. And always in the engagement surveys, people said we didn't communicate enough. Yeah, that's that's um that's a great point. Um, interested in the evolution of coaching, has coaching become too personal or caring? Should we take a leaf out of the old school coaching, toughness but fair? From Anthony. Okay. I mean, the thing is, when you go into these conversations, yes, there is a line around people's accountability. So it's not about you know giving over to everyone and, and basically giving them everything they want. Um, it's about making sure that they do their job responsibly, um, effectively, and that's ultimately why you're coaching. I think that you get much more out of an empathetic coach and someone that tries to put yourself in your shoes than you do 
with being being tough it depends too on the coaching situation so remember we talked about the three different ways that you're coaching so you're coaching for um career development you're coaching for performance and you're coaching for um you know incident related or emotional incident response so there's three different places that you are coaching at and they're different styles um too as well you would modify your style a little bit for each of those coaching circumstances um, one of the one of the questions that uh, actually a couple of people have mentioned this, um, Kerry, is how do you coach people to improve and grow when they're nearing the end of their career? Okay, um, um, and don't have a, that ambition. Um, yeah, and that's and that's and that's a good question, and and we face that a lot um, in some organisations, and it's about um, it's interesting because the good employees, the good people that are heading towards the end of their career, they're still curious. Um, they, they're still active, they're still interested. So it, it's about enriching their current role um, to ensure that that um, is, if they want to be um, in, inspired to do things. And there's always something, like even though people say, oh, you know, Fred's not going to, he's not interested, he does the same thing day in and day out, he's never going to change. There's always something, there's always something that you can um, catch on to to give them a little bit of inspiration to do something differently. The other thing is to think about as well, if you are at their end of their career, you've got to think about transition to retirement. Um, so that's a conversation that you could have to help map out their transition to retirement and, and also um, enhance what they're currently doing at the moment um, to make that transition to re retirement um, realistic um exciting interesting so you could possibly use that as a, as a lever as well um here's a specific example um kerry um i coach two people and there's a personal conflict between two of these members um mm. who are currently operating in two separate groups how could you mm. suggest i handle this best way what should i discuss with them to improve their relationship mm. Okay, Would so you're you coaching two different two different people in two different groups, and yeah. um, they're and in conflict with each other. Yes. So, is there a way that you can um, deal with that situation um, as a coach? Okay. Well, okay. So there's mediation. So it's not necessarily a coaching process. It's a mediation coach um, conversation that you have um, from a coach's perspective. And that's where I would go from that. Would that we'd have some an independent person come in and have you know um, a discussion with them? But it, a, and you as a manager can be in on that, but might not necessarily be the right person from a mediation mediation perspective. But as a coach, yeah. you can prepare that person, so you can walk them through because um, you're talking about performance at this point, um, because you're talking about behaviour of that individual then you can walk them through what behaviours you would like to see them work on and what your behaviours you would like to have displayed in the room of when you went in to do some mediation. Another way too Thanks, is Kerry. to maybe, put, maybe the other way to do it as well is to put them on a project together and hold them accountable, both accountable for the project's success. Yep. Thanks, Kerry. What is the best way to self-coach? Oh, wow. Um, okay. From a self-coach perspective, there's lots online that you can that you can look at. There's lots of things you can do from a development perspective. Um, there's lots of courses you can do. It's about um, if you, it's about building your one is building your um, resilience. So there's lots of things you can do around that. Um, and confidence and um, working on, um, you know, wellness. And then the other is about career development from a perspective of what's your next role. Um, so you have to think about, well, what what things do I need to learn or what's, what are my current gaps? So you work on that as well. So you can do, you know, I look to people to be curious about um, enhancing their own um, capability and looking to, you know, there's plenty of stuff out there to help. Yeah. And that's the, that comes back to the whole notion of, of learning and development for yourself. So um, one final thing, and I perhaps 
um, probably raised this at the beginning and may have confused people. IML does a lot of coaching and mentoring, and I put the two mm -hmm. together. We often do that as an institute. We say we offer coaching and mentoring. Someone said, mm. well, what's the difference between coaching and mentoring? Mm. Get asked this a lot. So from the perspective of coaching, we talked about the three. Usually what happens with the coaching is that um, for the most part, they're a person that is or uh, somebody that's actually in your discipline um, to help you around performance, around career development, etc. And mentoring, um, you look usually to outside of the organisation that could be in industry that, you know, will we'll help you um, where they've experienced other things in regards to your role in the for the future. So coaching is around, for me, performance and career development within an organisation and mentoring is more you look to outside the organisation or a person in another senior role in another part of the organisation. So a coach could be um, could be your immediate manager, it could be, you know, um, a HR manager, it could be, in fact, you know, another manager within within a particular area. But a, but a mentor to me, somebody, um, you know, in industry that's already, already accomplished um, things, a direction that you'd like to head. Does that make sense to Very you? Very um, fantastic answer and a great way to open. Yes, I think it did. It made sense to me. I hope there's some amazing comments coming through. Um, and uh, and yes, a lot of people have said, yep, that they, they understand it. And um, uh, one one um, comment I've got here, Kerry, thank you. Another great presentation with good insights and things to practice at work and in life generally. And I think that says it all, Kerry. Um, terrific um, presentation and skills that we can take not only in the workplace, but also outside of the workplace in supporting and coaching those around us um, at whatever we um, at whatever we're trying to achieve so I, I thank you very much um, for that um, presentation and, and answering those questions and there was a lot of them that weren't answered and we will take those on notice and we'll try to uh, reply to everyone that we didn't get back to um, live here on the webinar um, one final thing um, is that I hope you've all filled in the action plans and taken away those three key things. Um, as we said, we're not about ticking a box here. Um, it's actually about learning and taking away some outcomes. And I certainly took away some outcomes from Kerry's presentation. If you've got any questions or would like to speak to Kerry more thoroughly about coaching or um, anything else around the leadership development piece for you or your team, please contact us at info at managersandleaders.com.au. That's info at managersandleaders.com.au or call us on 1300 661 061. Thank you very much, Kerry. Um, a terrific presentation. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, everyone out there. Um, I appreciate go, your time. Go forth, go forth and coach. And we look... <laughs> Indeed, Kerry. And look, we're looking forward. There's been a number of comments actually about resilience in the questions. And great timing because resilience is coming up next with Jackie Perkins. So resilience um, starts in 15 minutes with Jackie at 1.45. So if you don't have the link, please email that info at managersandleaders.com.au and grab that link and please join us um, along with the, the other uh, thousands of people that are joining us today. So thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you in 15 minutes. Thanks again, Kerry. Thank you.